Welcome to episode 30 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and all sorts of other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for quite a while, and he also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode is part two of our two-part series discussing cholesterol. And if you haven't listened to part one of this series, I highly recommend you do that so you're all caught up for today's episode. Today we'll be talking about various other aspects of cholesterol. We'll be talking about what actually causes plaque buildup and heart disease and why cholesterol is not the culprit there. We'll be talking about why the omega-6s and omega-3s are not actually the heart-healthy fats. We'll be discussing how you can lower your cholesterol levels in a healthy way and why this does not include recommendations like eating lots of whole grains, nuts and seeds, vegetable oils, and fatty fish, which of course are often recommendations for lowering cholesterol and improving heart health. And then we'll also discuss the importance of our gut and thyroid health for lowering cholesterol. As a disclaimer for this episode and the previous episodes as well, none of this is medical advice, so make sure you talk with your uh, medical professional before making any dietary changes or otherwise. To check out the show notes for today's episode, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where I'll be linking to a ton of the studies surrounding cholesterol and heart health. There are a ton of them, and we definitely cannot get through all of them in these episodes. So if you want to take a look at those, you can head over to the show notes. And if you are trying to lower your cholesterol levels, if you are trying to increase your metabolism, reduce stress, improve your gut health, lose some weight, get rid of constant cravings and hunger, improve your energy, or balance out your hormones, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I will walk you through the main things to do as far as nutrition and lifestyle are concerned in order to do exactly that, in order to get rid of all of those low energy symptoms and maximize your cellular energy And I'll also discuss why this is so important when it comes to all sorts of chronic health conditions, whether that is heart disease or diabetes or autoimmune issues or any other sorts of chronic health conditions or symptoms. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And with that, let's get started. So essentially with plaque buildup in arteries, and we talked about the the main areas are in high pressure areas of of the vasculature and that's specifically within the aorta and the coronary arteries um, and places around the heart like that. You generally don't see any real plaque formation in the uh, the veins, the venous system. It's mostly in the arterial system, which is much higher pressure. Um, and essentially what you see in plaques is a buildup of foam cells, which are macrophages or immune cells that have eaten cholesterol but the specifically oxidized cholesterol. So they've eaten damaged cholesterol. Um, and the theoretical reason for this is because oxidized cholesterol, would it, which is, uh, it's just cholesterol that's been damaged. It's, it, the cholesterol molecule has been broken and by different mechanisms, different chemical pathways. And um, that's the basics of it. And so basically the, the immune cells eat these this damaged cholesterol to protect the endothelial cells, which are the cells that line the interior of your arteries and function in um, gas exchange of oxygen and and CO2 and things like that and nutrient exchange with red blood cells and whatnot and the the blood itself. Um, It protects them from the oxidized cholesterol because at certain levels or concentrations of oxidized cholesterol, the endothelial cells begin to get damaged or impaired. So what happens is these immune cells, these macrophages, eat up the damaged cholesterol and then they pull it into the middle layer of the artery. I think it's the intima. Um, and basically they just, they sequester it or they, they store it there. They detain it in the middle layer of the artery. So the, the endothelial cells, the small inner lining of the arteries or the thin inner lining of the arteries are protected from the damage. Um, so it's actually an immune function for damaged cholesterol. It's, and the other thing they specifically find there is high amounts of 
linoleic acid and and things like that. And this is this becomes important because the dietary recommendation in these situations is to lower saturated fat intake and increase polyunsaturated fat intake. And one of the main polyunsaturated fatty acids is linoleic acid, which is an omega-6 fatty acid. Um, and the reason that these fatty acids are often found there, or the theoretical, the theorized reason, um, is because the polyunsaturated fatty acid structure has double bonds in it. And we've talked about this previously. And the double bonds make the, the, the fatty acid, the polyunsaturated fatty acid, more susceptible to oxidative damage. They're more easily damaged um, by multiple different uh, chemical reactions within the body. And when they become damaged, they start to damage the cholesterol and the polyunsaturated fatty acids are, are found within the lipoprotein carriers. All other fatty acids are found within the lipoprotein carriers. This is LDL and HDL. And so when they're, when you have a high amount of polyunsaturated fatty acids in the diet, and then you're taking, and it's being transported through the blood in the LDL, um, carriers and cholesterol is also bound in there with it, then they basically, the PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acids can oxidize and then they can also cause the cholesterol to oxidize. And then when this happens, the macrophages, the immune cells go in and eat up the damaged cholesterol and damaged polyunsaturated fatty acids and move into the inner layer of the artery to protect the endothelial cells that are in, that are lining the artery from damage. So what you find out is not just saturated fatty acids because there's because they're so thick they just clog up the arteries that's not actually the case you don't find plaques on the inside or the endothelial layer of the artery you find them inside the wall of the artery itself and pulled in there theoretically by the macrophages so what you're seeing is a high amount of um unsaturated fatty acids within the diet particularly at least from the research that i've seen omega-6s which is linoleic acid um and with that said, when you start to look at the trends in heart disease and the change in dietary consumption and patterns over the course of the 20th century, you start to see that we have in massive increases in polyunsaturated fatty acid intake, particularly the omega-6s, and then massive increases in heart disease and cancer. And cancer is a, well, that's a different topic for a different time in relation to polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, and so they sort of trend together and it doesn't necessarily trend with sugar. It trends with polyunsaturated fatty acid consumption. And so that's really important to look at there, especially when the dietary recommendations for heart disease are to increase your PUFA intake. Yeah. So <laughs> what we, what we basically have here is damage to the, the lining of our blood vessels first as a product of inflammation, a lack of energy production, which there are various reasons for that. I mean, we've talked about thyroid health. We've talked about infection, uh, the polyunsaturated fats themselves, which can already be in that lining and, you know, inside those cells and, and be very susceptible to damage. They basically have dysfunction and inflammation and damage in, in, these li in this lining. And then you, you have the uh, cholesterol being deposited there from these LDL protein carriers, along with often fatty acids, which in this case are, are often the polyunsaturated ones, which is sometimes already damaged as it's being carried around. Um, yep. If not, it's pretty likely to be damaged in that area. But the point is that these are kind of coming as firemen to the fire to try to put the fire out, to try to stop the inflammation, stop the, the, uh, the damage and restore proper energy production, restore proper function. And if that were to happen, which is constantly happening all the time, and you didn't have this underlying dysfunction, then you'd be fine. That The damage would be healed, regenerated, everything would be okay. But instead, you have this underlying dysfunction that results from all sorts of things, a lack of nutrients, uh, the presence of various metabolic toxins, and on and on, that stops these processes from working properly. So then you have this deposition of the cholesterol and fatty acids, which instead of fixing the problem are unable to because there's such dysfunction and this continues and the cholesterol and fatty acids continue to be deposited along with, as you had mentioned, some of these white blood cells, which are also part of the immune system. They're there because of the inflammation and altogether these, basically this, <laughs> this line of dysfunction leads to a buildup of the these white blood cells the plaque the the cholesterol the fatty acids which make up this plaque and end up yeah. 
blocking things up. Yep. So the white blood cells actually die from the accumulation of these fatty acids. And then within the plaques, you get centers of necrotic tissue, which is just dead blood cells, white blood cells, generally macrophages, and right. uh, just fat oxidized fatty acid particles. Which so are normally the polyunsaturated fatty which, acids. Exactly. They, which so so we're told that not only does cholesterol block up our arteries, but so does saturated fat. But when they actually look at the composition of the plaque, it's not it's saturated fat. It's it's the polyunsaturated fats, and yeah. it's damaged polyunsaturated fats to be exactly specific. Yeah. Exactly, and I think there's so and and just to clarify also about these fats, the polyunsaturated fats are the ones that we're told are healthy. They have the heart healthy sticker. These are the vegetable oils. Uh, they're in nuts and seeds. They're in fatty fish like salmon. These are, these are the ones that we're told are supposed to help us if we have heart disease. Yet these are the ones that are found in the plaques and contribute to the inflammation and dysfunction that is leading to plaque buildup yep. rather than the saturated ones, which are the ones that are found in animal products, uh, you know, butter, what, it depends on the type of animal product, yep. but dairy, all that, all that, which um, are very stable and not susceptible to that damage. And so those are not the problem. And have been used for centuries prior to the introduction of seed of heavy amounts of seed oils. Right. Where we didn't have heart disease in the centuries that, or we didn't have such high amounts of heart disease and chronic disease in the century that those were used, right. which is something important to point out. The other thing that's important to point out is the polyunsaturated fatty acids were discussed as there are recommended as being used because they lower cholesterol in the blood. Right. But the mechanism by which they do this is by damaging um, cellular production in the liver of cholesterol. <laughs> right. So they so, have like multiple damaging effects where they lower cholesterol in the blood by damaging the liver to some extent. And then they also damage the vasculature and decrease the amount of protective cholesterol in general. So it's like a, a twofold negative effect. And then the other thing is they have a, a, a negative effect on metabolism in general. And I think that's a topic for another episode. Well, and we've talked about it extensively yeah. in the previous episode, so I'll link to that. But Yeah. And I, something interesting to add to that, a bit anecdotal, but when we were doing, so over the course of time, we, you and I have both donated blood relatively mm -hmm. regularly. And when we were doing high fat, low carb, um, I have my cholesterol blood results from then. And yeah. I was about, and this is what I was thinking, maybe 20. And mm -hmm. 20 years old. And at this point I had about 198 milligrams per deciliter total cholesterol at 20 years old. Over time, I switched up my diets it, at, for a little while I was in the one fifties. And then I, uh, started using thyroid. And at one point I was using uh, maybe a little bit too much thyroid and my cholesterol is down to 88, 80 total <laughs> cholesterol of 88 milligrams per deciliter. And you can see the trend on where I donated blood of it dropping. And, and that, sort of corresponds to me increasing my carbohydrate intake in my diet from being zero carb to moving towards, I guess I did intermittent fasting for a little while and then moving um, into like a more paleo and then getting to Pete and then sort of finding my own way from there. Um, and you can see my cholesterol level sort of drop as I increase carbohydrates basically and track my diet over time. So I think just an interesting example, because at 20, they would consider 198 cholesterols high. And right now I'd be marvelously low by medical standards. Right. Which is not a level that we're suggesting. No, no. As you said, that was a mistake. Yeah. Yeah. Too much, too much thyroid use. But so, and, and for mine, I mean, my, I had a similar, but more exaggerated fluctuation in cholesterol where when I was on the low carb, high fat, my total cholesterol was about 275, which is way beyond high from from normal standards and uh, for sure doctors would have had me on statins and I was about the same age at that point. And then after introducing, you know, after when I actually first started introducing a lot of starchy carbs because of some gut issues, my cholesterol remained pretty high up in the two fifties. And, you know, we both experienced symptoms at that point as well, but then fixing the gut issues, refining my diet further and, and increasing carbs considerably, my cholesterol was in, you know, into the one between one fifty and 200, you know, 160, 170, 180, depending on, on the time. Um, but dropped over 100 points in uh, maybe six months to a year. And yeah, and, and so I do want to clarify also that what we're not saying here is that because, you know, the high fat itself was what caused the high levels of cholesterol. 
but rather the lack of carbohydrates, which was depressing our metabolism, our which led to function, yeah. yeah, and thyroid function, which led to the low cholesterol. So right now we still eat relatively high fat and high saturated fat within that fat, very low polyunsaturated fats, and our cholesterol is in a good Are healthy fine. range. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, and this so, is. To, to put this in perspective, both of us are eating, at, or at least from what I remember, we're eating decent amounts of saturated fat, and we don't have highly elevated cholesterols or anything like that. And that's on a consistent basis, eating decent amount with very, very little polyunsaturated fatty acids in the diet. Right. Um, that's probably the only thing that I even look at now for <laughs> my dietary intake is to make sure I'm not, I don't eat too much. And it, it's rarely that I check it at this point because I've gone into my own rhythm, but high amounts and this is directly opposed to the traditional mainstream model which is decent we're eating decent amounts of animal proteins decent amounts of saturated fatty acids a, a large amount of carbohydrates as particularly in the form of sugars from fruit and things like that um and i mean i have a decent amount of fiber in my diet but that's just from the fruit um, right which is directly opposed to the low fat low sugar <laughs> low animal protein low salt diet that is recommended by every heart doctor for your for your issues or almost every heart doctor right and this is again shown in in more recent research research that has gone far beyond the seven country study looking at (laughs) saturated fat and and heart disease but uh the more recent research looking at the types of fats uh that we're eating and cardiovascular disease risk have found virtually no association between saturated fat and cardiovascular disease and um instead as you had mentioned a correlation between polyunsaturated fats, specifically the omega sixes, and cardiovascular disease. So. Yeah. The, with all this said, I would think it's important to point out that this doesn't mean that omega threes get a free pass for heart disease, and that taking tons of fish oils is a good idea. The omega threes, even though there's a lot of the recent research is focusing on particularly the omega sixes and linoleic acid, the omega threes are and specifically the fish oils are more easily susceptible to oxidation. And so there's the research is still going through this because the omega three craze just recently started, I think what in the, in the late 1990s, early two thousands is when the fish oil and omega three thing became a huge deal. Um, but there's now they're moving into, well, it's not omega sixes, it's omega threes and ratios and things like that. So I don't think it, I still don't think there's a free pass for omega threes. Just looking at the chemistry of the omega three fatty acids and their ability to oxidize being ridiculously <laughs> higher than monounsaturated, saturated, and even omega six fatty acids. So, yeah. and there's quite a bit of research there looking at omega threes and showing that it does not reduce heart disease risk and and is implicated yeah. in it as well. And it does cause oxidative stress within the body and depletes things like vitamin E and stuff like that, mm-hmm. which is important to look at. Yeah, and another uh, evident, you know, piece of evidence to consider. I know you were talking about just dietary changes in dietary intake of the polyunsaturated fats and saturated fats in the culture over time. You know, where for the longer, much longer period of time, we were eating more saturated fats, butter, dairy, meat, and then everything shifted towards the oils, and we see all these issues with heart uh, heart health. But we, you know, we can also look at various tribal cultures that are still eating high amounts of saturated fats and have virtually no heart disease. So yeah, uh, there's cultures in Africa doing that and, and elsewhere as well. Um, I don't remember what must maybe it's in one of the tropical countries where a lot of their fats are from coconut, which I there's think there's Catawba. The, yeah, yeah, and Catawba and like Tokelau or something like that, which is the their Pacific Island nations right. that rely mostly on uh, pork fed coconuts and coconut fat itself and they have like 20 (laughs) percent of the diet of is saturated fatty acids which is like heinous in modern medical standards but they have and they smoke religiously but they don't have any heart disease (laughs) or they have very very minimal heart disease also just to clarify i think you mean coconut fed pork so pigs that are fed coconut not coconut what i say coconut fed fed pigs (laughs) (laughs) he said said pork fed coconuts which or Pork fed coconut, which I know what you meant, but it was just a little unclear. So yeah, pigs <laughs> pigs fed coconut. And the reason why that's important is because in modern day in or in, in like you know, in America and most uh I don't know, Western countries, pigs are fed all sorts of unsaturated fats, grains, and seed oils. And because of that, their fats have much higher amounts of the polyunsaturated fats, the what we would say are the less healthy ones or unhealthy ones. And yeah. 
the so the reason why you clarified that these uh, pigs are fed coconut is because coconut is more saturated. So instead of getting polyunsaturated fats from pork fat, which you would get if you got it in a Western uh, society, their the, their pork would have been mostly saturated. And then, as you said, yeah, they eat a lot of coconut themselves too. Yeah, there's also imp- yeah. like some interesting studies on areas in India, and I think there's some areas in Sri Lanka and then the Philippines not recent but a little bit further past where they were looking at their consumption of fatty acids and basically showing that these areas had really high consumptions of saturated fatty acids and low amounts of disease Mm -hmm. um and kerala india is like known for eating high amounts of coconut oil and things like that and a lot of people are gonna or some people who look at the research say oh well because they're medium chain fatty acids um i mean there's there's still saturated fatty acids coconut oil does have some palmitic acid in it which is a, a longer chain saturated fatty acid. So it's, I mean, you're basically seeing the trend in, some, in these different areas. Um, and then you also can look at previous, like the basically way people are looking at it now is previous consumption of saturated fatty acids in different areas. Um, looking at like what old cookbooks used to be and things like that and showing high amounts of butter intake and specifically beef tallow used to be a huge one in the United States mm-hmm. and having like really low amounts of heart disease relative to, um, relative to what we have going on now and cancer as well. Much, a lot of, uh, I don't think people realize that a lot of diseases that we're seeing now, like autoimmunity and cancer and heart disease were relatively rare, like very rare, depending on which time period you're looking at back in the day. And even in the early 1900s, you're seeing, um, very rare or low amounts of heart disease and cancer and things like that. And autoimmunity wasn't even... (laughs) That was, I don't even know if that was even coined at that point yet. Yeah. 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 There's been basically epidemic proportions of, of all of those diseases, um, recently. Yeah. And West and it's own pandemic, almost a pandemic because <laughs> <laughs> it's in, in a, almost all the Western nations are seeing mass upticks and things like, especially if they're following the American model, which is high amounts of polyunsaturated fatty acids and refined grains and high amounts of refined sugar, high fructose corn syrup and low nutrient diets and things like that. Mm. Um, Cause the a traditional American diet isn't salad and nuts and, and salmon and, and I don't know what else, olive oil. <laughs> That's the <Yeah>. Mediterranean <laughs> diet. <laughs> the traditional American diet, at least they look at in studies is like muffins and whatever else. Right. So it's important to point that out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, also just talking about countries that are good examples of, of the problems with, with all this research or with the idea, the cholesterol hypothesis, uh, Japan is another one, one of the, the main ones that I think started the, some of the questions as far as cholesterol levels and mortality and heart disease risk. So. Yeah. So, to, I mean, obviously, so at this point we've <clears throat> explained that blood levels of cholesterol are not the problem. Dietary cholesterol is not the problem. Dietary saturated fat is not the problem. So let's say, you know, we do have somebody with elevated cholesterol levels. We've mentioned some things that could be related here as far as thyroid function goes, uh, some sort of immune function or activity due to an infection, and on from there. So if somebody does have much higher levels of cholesterol, that is, you know, in, in a way that might be concerning as a symptom based on their age which we kind of alluded to earlier that as you age, having those higher levels of cholesterol in the 200s is, uh, appears to be much safer. And so assuming that somebody is concerned that they have high cholesterol and they're concerned that they're at a high risk of heart disease, or maybe they do already have heart disease, but you know, they're on all these medications to reduce their cholesterol and on from there. Let's talk through what the ideal approach would be to a improve those symptoms but not do it just by improving the symptoms instead fixing the root issues uh, as far as what might be going on and how, what adjustments to make to fix those things. Well, I guess the the most important one to start would be to take traditional guidelines and sort of ignore them for a little bit. I know you (laughs) shouldn't technically (laughs) say that, but I would lessen the intake of polyunsaturated fatty acids as much as possible and I would increase intake of saturated fatty acids coming from things like beef and dairy. If you tolerate dairy well, if not, even if you're using butter, if you don't tolerate dairy proteins well, um, coconut oil, uh, what else? Macadamia nut oil is a good source. 
chocolate, cocoa butter, all those things are, are great fats to use. I wouldn't cook with macadamia nut oil. If I was going to do my cooking, I would stick with either coconut oil or cocoa butter or beef towel or something like that. Or butter. Um, or butter. And then I would focus on, if you're having um, like diabetes or anything like that, I would focus, and even with heart disease, focus on the gut, um, specifically by removing a lot of refined starch and in, starchy food intake and move towards a uh, higher fruit intake with and higher specific vegetables like carrots or cooked leafy greens or something like that. Um, and have a decent amount of protein intake from animal proteins. Uh, and some people might benefit from the use of collagen hydrolysate to help rebuild arteries and things like that. And then the other thing, and all these things should support thyroid function, but maybe, and if you want to go through maybe some supplemental things, but maybe using some type of supplemental thyroid would be helpful, especially depending on how far in the hole you are with all that type of stuff. Yeah. So let's slow that down a little bit and, and explain it step by step. So as far as, <laughs> so as you were saying first, the fats is a huge component here. And we, I'll, again, I'll link to that PUFA versus saturated fat episode, but reducing our consumption of the polyunsaturated fats, which are in vegetable oils. So anything that's fried is going to be high in those vegetable oils, which I guess is one thing we can agree on with convention. You know, most people in the conventional medical field where they'll, where they'll say not to eat fried food. So uh, fried food, or that's packaged foods, a lot of yeah. Packaged and foods. yeah, most processed foods are going to be high in polyunsaturated fats. And this is one of those areas that's so frustrating when it does come to the, the modern guidelines or what a doctor will say is so often they're, they're just saying, avoid any of the, any meat, anything high in cholesterol and saturated fat outside of that, eat whatever. And so, so many people go to all of the grain based products and, you know, breads and pasta and cookies and whatever that are just low in fat as if those are better, but in reality, they're causing major problems for one of those major ones is the polyunsaturated fats. And we've yeah. discussed the that. other one could be gut diet, dysbiosis and gut issues as well. Right. Yeah. So, so we'll get there in a second, but so as far as these, the fats go avoiding the polyunsaturated fats, that would be in fried foods and packaged foods, the things that you're looking for, any of those vegetable oils, canola oils, any of the seed oils, those are all going to be higher in the polyunsaturated fats. Uh, other places that or other foods that are high in the polyunsaturated fats would be the would be fatty fish like salmon and various sea bass and things that that are very high in fat and those are high in those omega threes that we're told are healthy but in reality are contributing to all these issues. Uh, additionally, nuts and seeds are another ones that are are other ones that are really high in these fats that again we're told are are heart healthy but in reality uh, are really susceptible to damage or part of this whole especially roasted especially roasted yeah. nuts and seeds because yeah. you may yeah. already at that point have a ton of oxidized fats in them because most nuts and seeds would be our omega-6s and with the exception of i think like flaxseed which is still an omega-3 walnuts walnuts yeah so it's important and then um what was i going to say if you're having a lot of metabolic issues i would just say try your best to eliminate packaged foods like as much as like shelf stable packaged food as much as possible and rely more on homemade foods and fresh fruit or dried if you're going to do packaged foods like dried fruit or something like that or um things along those lines and less chips and crackers and cookies and cakes and there are companies that may have good ingredients in some of those things but if you're really that far down in the metabolic hole where you're having heart disease already heart disease issues already or you have a decent amount of obesity or diabetes or something like that it's best to sort of make a a pretty decent change to start and get more stabilized before you can start moving into those other directions. But at the minimum, if you're like, eh, I still want to eat my cakes and cookies. There are some companies like Tate to make good cookies or things like that, um, that don't have so such problematic ingredients. Right. And so in that case, as far as the fats go, you'd be looking for things like butter, coconut oil, olive oil is okay as well. Uh, yeah. cocoa butter, avocado or, oil. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so those would be all much better than the typical canola or, or other vegetable oils. Yeah. But oils. still not ideal, especially if you're really in, in the hole metabolically. Right, right. And palm oil is another one that's generally pretty good, just to, to add that to the list. So yeah. The, so that's some of the main things as far, as far as avoiding the polyunsaturated fats. Another, oh, another important area would be fatty chicken and fatty pork have high amounts of the polyunsaturated fats, because they're typically fed high amounts of the polyunsaturated fats, but if they're fed 
more saturated fats if, if they're pasture raised eating a more natural diet then they'll have less of those polyunsaturated fats so you would really have to know the source there but in general most fatty chicken and, and fatty pork will be very high in PUFA uh, whereas other ruminant animals which would be beef and goat and lamb those ones are even if they're fed a lot of PUFA their fats are going to be mostly saturated so it's not as much of a concern there and the same would go from dairy which is from those animals which is mostly saturated as well so again not you know the fats from those foods and dairy are typically much better much more stable yeah. yeah and also for protein not fat low low polyunsaturated fatty acid low mercury varieties of sea- seafood which yeah. includes shellfish and certain fish like cod yeah. um cod flounder. or sole flounder um for some people People, if you prepare sardines the right way, they're not going to kill you once in a while. They have a decent yeah. amount of nutrients and things like that. Mussels, oysters, clams, shrimp, uh, squid. Lo- I think lobster is pretty good, just uh-huh. not in a lot because it has a decent amount of um, a mercury in it, um, which is something else to watch out for. So th- those things would all be helpful. And they also have a lot of nutrients. For some people, uh, like an egg or two a day shouldn't really cause that much issue. If you're really having a lot of metabolic issues to start, maybe uh, stay away from them for a little bit, or if you're having autoimmune things or whatever, and then introduce them at another point in time. But for most people to have some eggs for breakfast should be okay. Yeah. From a digestive standpoint or an immuno reactivity standpoint, some people don't do well with them. But if you like f- don't have a negative response to them, I mean, nutrient wise, I think they're, they're really great. Eggs are. Yeah. Especially yeah. if you're having liver issues. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the fat soluble vitamins that are in there, and other nutrients as well are all really, really helpful from the heart disease standpoint, from the diabetes yeah. standpoint, any any sort of issues metabolically. Uh, so I, I would say those are, are really good. And as far as fish goes too, just to add a couple other leaner fish, mahi-mahi, grouper, trout, halibut are all, I, I mean, yeah. I know grouper, I think there's some mercury concerns, but uh, tuna yeah, would so be another one that's lean, but mercury concerns there Skipjack, too. I think skipjack tuna, like a uh, light skipjack tuna has very little amount of fat and has a very, uh, a, a lower amount of mercury at least. So, and gr- I know grouper and I think mahi have a decent amount. Of, so these are things to not consume like every single day, but I think those are pretty lean. It up. Not I fat, think... mercury, mercury. Oh, oh, oh. Because yeah. they're larger fish. Grouper yeah. and mahi are larger. Right. And then tr- uh, trout, I mean... You could, that depends on fresh water or salt water or whatever you're doing there. So, yeah. I guess the next one was to any type of gut issue. Um, well, well, there's still some other things nutrition okay. wise, dietary wise. I mean, so we talked about the fats, which is a big component. Um, but as we talked about earlier, when you're on a low carb diet, which is in a lot of the alternative sphere, a lot of the sphere that is acknowledged the problems within the the lipid hypothesis and the cholesterol hypothesis as far as heart disease goes, they are very much fans of low carb, high fat diets, which oftentimes lead to high cholesterol. It's, you know, a, a lot of the prominent figures in those uh, spheres talk about how they have high cholesterol and they just say that it's not a problem. Yeah. And, and there's good evidence that it's not a problem in that case. However, it is a symptom uh, of low thyroid function and low metabolism, which we discussed. Which is a problem in that case. <laughs> True, yes. <Yeah. laughs> a low I, metabolism is a problem in that case. Yeah, that is not no, an ideal place. The high cholesterol may not be the problem. Right. It's not, case, yeah, exactly. But having the saying. low metabolism chronically in that case and chronically elevating cortisol and things like that will be an issue over Absolutely. the long term. Yeah, yeah. And so because of that, having enough carbohydrates is vital to metabolic health and therefore heart health as well. And we will discuss the gut issues, but because the gut is such a major problem here, we want to make sure that we're getting enough carbohydrates and we're getting enough from easily digestible sources and ones that have a lot of nutrients. So we'll discuss the digestible side, but uh, just in general, fruits are a really great option here. Oftentimes root vegetables and, uh, you know, like potatoes, sweet potatoes and uh, and some, some of the, like the fruit vegetables like squashes, pumpkin, zucchini, uh, are all good options too. Yeah. And fruit juice, dried fruits, all good. Right. And then some people do well with tubers. Yeah. And yeah. Sweet potatoes, tubers, white potatoes. Yeah. So. Right. Yeah. So, so I think that those are the most, I mean, and then getting enough protein is, is always important as well. And we discussed getting the, getting protein from the low PUFA sources, uh, you know, the ruminant animals, beef, lamb, uh, goat, 
lean chicken or pork is fine as well. Dairy is another good source. And then lean seafood, uh, which is very nutrient dense and eggs too. So those are all good protein sources. And then, yeah, let's touch on the gut issues a little bit. We've talked about endotoxin, but maybe we can make some clarifications there and what that means as far as what we should eat depending on our symptoms. Yeah, so I think for the gut issues, it's just important. The, uh, we talked about endotoxin being a huge player, making sure you don't have any dysbiosis or overgrowth in the small bowel and things like that. And a lot of times that's actually caused by diet and low low thyroid function and low metabolism and things like that. So making sure you're having enough carbohydrate in general. If you do already have the situation present, like a, a gut dysbiosis present, then focusing on uh, juices specifically that and things that are really easily digested and then maybe using some herbal antimicrobials um, and things like that and making sure you have some some decent sources of uh, fiber like fruit and vegetable fiber and things like that to help to help move things forward and move things along and and then adjust the microbiome or the flora the type of species within the colon a lot of this is adjusted by diet um, and so a parallel to what you see with, I think what goes on with a lot of people is if you feed animals, particularly ruminant animals like horses or, uh, cows, a lot of grain, a lot of refined grain or anything like that, whether it's a lot of corn or a lot of oats or a lot of, uh, wheat or things like that, they tend to get very bloated and mm -hmm. dysbiotic bellies. And that you can see a lot of people walking around with the big bloated beer bellies, things like that. Um, <laughs> And essentially that they have, they can die from that, from an overload of endotoxin. So, it, and it, I think there's a lot of parallels there with humans, even though we don't have the same type of digestive tract as these other animals do, but making sure that you're eating the right things for the digestive tract, which would be fruit and uh, specific vegetables and things like that to encourage, to, dis, to encourage the right or to encourage the right species of bacteria, I guess you would say, or limit bacterial growth in the specifically limit bacterial growth in the small intestine, um, and then allow for the, the the to avoid the wrong bacterial species from growing in the colon and things like that. Because it's going to be in, you're going to have bacteria in the colon no matter what you do. And the other thing that's helpful for this in clearing the small intestine, besides like an herbal antimicrobial and making sure you're eating decent amount of relatively or decent amount of specific fibers is making sure you're taking in uh, a decent amount of monounsaturated and saturated fatty acids, which can stimulate bile production in the small intestine, which is dependent upon cholesterol production. Um, bile is made from cholesterol and then the bile will help to clear out the small intestine. It has an antimicrobial effect. Um, and then there's other more specific strategies that you can get into if you're really having a lot of gut issues. Um, and in certain situations with like, obesity or diabetes and things like that, that there can be a lot of gut things going on. Um, so it can take some time to adjust what's going on there. But in general, having a solid diet that we talked about with a decent amount of fruits and ve specific vegetables, which have high amounts of protective plant compounds that have an encouraging effect on some species and inhibit other species, eating a decent amount of the right fatty acids and making sure you have a decent amount of protein so your liver and everything is functioning well can help and turn the table back in um, a positive direction for gut health and things like that. And then there's other, again, there's other stuff that you can do if you're really having issues, but the solid diet that we've mentioned in multiple other podcasts and that we just discussed previously is one of the most important steps for maintaining good gut health and avoiding a lot of the really irritating foods or foods that can cause dysbiosis. Yeah. And thyroid health too, which, which we'll discuss. So, so I don't want to dig too much into the digestion thing, but just to kind of give more of a brief overview, we want to make sure that we're digesting our food well and that the bacteria and fungus that naturally inhabit, inhabit our, <laughs> that naturally inhabit our gut are the healthy types that are not producing damaging inflammatory compounds. And so we've discussed this extensively in previous episodes and I'll link to those gut episodes, but the, the, the bacterial issue is a huge issue that we've discussed as far as endotoxin goes, which is implicated in weight gain and obesity, diabetes, and also heart disease, plaque formation, atherosclerosis, all of these processes. And so eating in a way that will not lead to, that will lead to a healthy gut microbiome, meaning healthy bacterial populations and fungus and everything, and will not lead to the production of these metabolic toxins is a huge component when it comes to heart health and metabolism overall. 
So you had mentioned fruit being fruit and, and the right types of vegetables being important. Just to add some clarifications there, ripe, good quality fruit makes a huge difference for uh, supporting gut health. Uh, cooked vegetables rather than raw is very important, and especially you know and making sure that any root vegetables you're having are well cooked. Those are really important components. And as you said, getting enough fat and actually having enough cholesterol is vital as well for producing enough bile to keep the bacteria out of our small intestine where they're definitely going to be causing problems. So those are all important to consider from the gut health side. Uh, it is a pretty complex topic, so I'll link to some of those other uh, other podcasts where we discussed gut and digestion in more depth if that is uh, something that you know somebody wants to dig into a little further. And then, as I alluded to as well, thyroid health is, is a huge component here. And so eating enough carbohydrates is massively important for supporting thyroid health, supporting our metabolism. We've talked through these this relationship in in detail previously, and I'll link to some articles about it as well. But when our metabolism is healthy and working well, it's got enough fuel to produce enough energy to work properly. It also leads to higher thyroid function, and this helps to keep our gut clear, uh, our small intestine clear by increasing cholesterol and bile production, increasing movement of th- food throughout the intestines, and, and the ability to produce more digestive enzymes and, and everything from there. So Doing these things in general, which includes reducing the polyunsaturated fats, eating easily digestible carbohydrates and enough of them, getting enough protein, eating enough food overall, which most people who are dieting all the time, especially people who are concerned about heart health, are probably naturally going to be eating very little or eating much less when they're trying to avoid all animal products and on from there, uh, especially saturated fats and things. Not eating enough is going to lead to depressed thyroid activity, depressed metabolism, which is also going to contribute to all these issues, including the gut problems and and further metabolic problems. So making sure you're eating enough to support your metabolism and thyroid health is is also going to be a pretty huge component for as far as heart disease is concerned. Yep. I agree. I don't really have much to add to that one. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I don't think I have much to add either. I mean, I think that we didn't talk about exercise as much either, but being you know relatively active is a good thing i would mention also that the idea that we just want to exercise more and more for heart health is is not always the case and there is right there is actually a correlation between excessive amounts of exercise and having heart issues heart attacks so specifically long-term endurance exercise right but even in general overtraining or even with training with weights training way too much or things like that will number one increase cortisol levels, which has a effect of raising triglycerides and cholesterol and blood sugar and things like that, yeah. and lowering protective steroid hormones. Um, and then it also has an effect to lower thyroid function. So it's important not to overtrain. It's important and to especially stay away from long distance running and things like that, is which is proven not to be good for any anyone. There's not really any benefit to running. 5Ks and things like that, besides whatever sort of goal, mental goal you have for yourself. But there's been shown to have direct negative effects on that, including damaging the gut and causing leakiness in the gut and, and, and losses in immune function and things like that directly after races. So, and then negative effects on the liver. So it's important to stay away from that type of stuff and, and have do more. We talked about this before, like enjoyable activities, um, you know, picking up a new sport or, if you like lifting weights, lifting weights, or going to the beach, paddle boarding, martial arts, dancing, whatever it is, things like that. Um, and the other thing I think it's important, a lot of doctors talk about lowering your weight to lower heart health. A lot of times the weight is more of a dietary thing and not so much as the not exercising enough. Not getting enough activity is an issue, but it's not necessarily that you need to exercise. If you're going for a walk with your dog or you're going to the beach or you're I don't know, you're playing tennis with your friends. I mean, it can be an enjoyable thing. It doesn't have to be an actual exercise. Right. Um, so that, that's important to, to know that most of the weight issues, I, at least in my experience, would be related more towards diet and not so much as not exercising, not running X number of minutes on a treadmill or anything like that. And then activity is important. And then the, just other basic ones. Not smoking is important. <laughs> Lowering stress in general is important getting enough sleep is important and we've touched on all of these before we have podcasts and all of these topics or i don't know if we talked about smoking but i feel like that's beating 
multiple dead horses at this point. I mean, how many <laughs> ads do you have to see on TV about it? And well, I'm sure if there's an ad, that means it's true, right? Yeah, I'm sure everyone's <laughs> doctor has told them about the negative effects of smoking. Well, I guess, yeah, I mean, I'm kind of joking, but obviously I do think this is one area where we do agree that that inhaling extremely hot smoke is actually damaging and not helpful. So. Yeah, and uh, smoking is not a good idea. So, but yeah, and, and then the weight issue, I think, is mostly more of a dietary issue. So, and it's not in terms of eating too much calories or anything like that, but having like the food that you're eating is causing some types of gut issues or metabolic issues by damaging cells and things like that. For, for example, like eating too much PUFA or eating too much refined grain products that have a whole bunch of other fillers and whatnot in them. Um, so things like that, just like the, some of the basic advice that you get from your doctors are right. And we're talking, this is very specific onto the areas that we don't agree with. Um, and the different hypotheses that are, opposite of what's been said and why um but those other areas still apply right and just just to clarify the weight loss and exercise of course activity can play a role there especially when you're coming from being sedentary to at least having some amount of activity uh we talked about that relationship extensively and just weight loss in general and other episodes so i'll link to those and yeah as far as the long distance cardio and things you're you know you were mentioning the problems there and i do think you know there's a big difference between running a mile or two versus five or ten or fifteen or going for a marathon which those are i think that really the longer distance side is the point where more it, damaging yeah yeah just excessive amounts of stress that even if you're recovering from it afterwards or or it's a lot tougher to recover from it's, it's a pretty major stressor whereas if you're just running a couple miles and you enjoy it and it's something that you recover from well and you're eating enough especially enough carbs then that's much less of a concern so um, it's it's a matter of dialing that in based on your needs based on so many of these other factors that you mentioned how much we're eating sleep yeah. uh, stress on from there so I'll, I'll link to those other episodes where we talked about that a little bit further yeah all right all right i hope you enjoyed that episode i did want to add in a little bit about the relationship between thyroid and cholesterol that we did discuss a little bit throughout the episode but I just wanted to make sure to emphasize how important this relationship is and this this connection between thyroid activity and cholesterol levels has been known for over 100 years at this point and thyroid hormone as a medication or supplement was basically used for a pretty long time to lower cholesterol levels prior to a lot of the drugs that are used today and, and the drugs prior to those. So it is a pretty reliable way to decrease uh, cholesterol, and that doesn't mean that you have to take thyroid hormone to increase thyroid activity. Uh, much of what we talked about today, as far as diet and lifestyle goes, does improve thyroid health and metabolism, which will have that same effect. But again, using thyroid medications or hormones can also be helpful for lowering cholesterol, and is a much better way to do so by really by really improving things at the root of the issue. Of course, that same medical disclaimer, discuss any of this with your doctor prior to making any changes, but just wanted to highlight how important that connection is between thyroid and cholesterol. And I know that Mike and I talked about this at least a little bit in terms of our own experiences where when we did things to improve our thyroid health and improve our metabolism, we saw our cholesterol levels drop considerably. So I definitely think that that's uh, worth mentioning. If you did enjoy this series and today's episode, please leave us a like, a comment, a review, a five-star rating on iTunes. All of those things really do a ton to help support the podcast. To check out the show notes for today's episode, including all of the studies that we talked about and as well as the ones that we didn't, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast. And if you are looking to improve your metabolism, increase your thyroid activity and thyroid health in order to drop uh, in order to lower cholesterol levels, or if you're looking to improve your gut health for the same reason, or lower stress, or if you're just looking to improve various other low energy symptoms, whether that's weight gain or joint pain or chronic cravings and hunger or a lack of energy or hormonal imbalances, low libido, uh, infertility, all of those things come down to what's going on in that energetic level. And if you are looking for some help there, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll walk you through some of the more important things to focus on as far as diet and lifestyle are concerned in order to maximize your cellular energy and resolve all of those symptoms as well as other chronic health conditions like 
diabetes and heart disease and autoimmune issues and, and all sorts of other chronic health conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I will see you in the next episode.